Cool. So, hi, everybody. Hi, Risa. Welcome to the Hello. Design and ADP group sessions. I'm Devki Nandini, and I'm your host for today on behalf of Design Board. Um, we hear quite a bit about design systems of late. And in fact, we've had Ashish Anand in one of our earlier sessions where he told us the importance of having a design system using some very interesting analogies of um, weaponry and war. So I think if you guys have the time, you should check that out right after this session for context. Um, and Risa today is taking it a step further where she's going to take us through strategies of approaching, designing, and building a design system from scratch. And uh, we will also get to see how she built one in her current company. So how to overcome all the challenges and everything. So um, thanks for joining, Risa. We can yeah. Start uh, sorry, what did you say? I said we can start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Okay. So can everyone see my screen? Great. So for starters, let me give a brief introduction. Um, so my name is Risa Lederberg. I am a senior product designer at Openly. I currently live in New York City and I have a background in graphic design, UX design, and in college, I studied psychology. So now we're gonna jump into what is a design system. So this is just a brief quote of, you know, that I follow a scalable framework of decisions and team behaviors across a product portfolio to converge on a cohesive experience. So this is a quote by someone who's really relevant in the design system world and has done a lot of talks on it. So highly suggest if you have a chance to go look at some of his work. So why do we need a design system? So I'm gonna walk you through kind of an analogy that I have recently come up with and I think does a really good job of explaining the need of a design system. So I'm kind of gonna start by telling you a story. So I'd like you to meet Sally. She is a chef. So Sally is um, trying to start selling her grandma's tomato sauce that her grandma taught her how to make a long time ago. So she has all this knowledge in your head, her head of how to make it. And she decides, I'm going to turn this into the business. So the business starts doing really well. And she hires her brother to come help her. She has to have her brother help her. She has to give her brother a few instructions on something that he might not know. But for the most part, because he's in the family and already knows the recipe, it doesn't take him long to pick it up. So then as their business grows, it starts booming. They start selling in a number of different stores and Sally has to hire more cooks. So at first, you know, it's great. Business is booming. This is awesome. But what ends up happening is because there's no written instructions on how to make this tomato sauce, your chance of having to spend a lot of time with each individual, making sure that they're using the right ingredients and checking their work every single time. And this causes a lot of delay in production. So what does she do? She decides, okay, let me create a recipe book because she just realizes the path that she was on is not actually scalable. So with this example, it's very similar to why one needs a design system. And that example, you can see without that recipe book, without those instructions, there was no way for Sally to scale her tomato sauce business. Same thing with the design system. There's no way to scale your design and your product without having some sort of design system, which is essentially instructions that anyone who's gonna be working on the design system can follow. So what happens without it? Well, in that previous story, there was inconsistencies between the sauce. As you can see here, there's inconsistencies between these two different things. So these two screens actually come from the company that I currently work at. This is before I joined and there was no design system. So looking at these two in inconsistencies, you can see that the headers are different, the placement of the buttons at the bottom are different. So even though they might be using the same buttons, the actual components themselves are completely different and create inconsistencies. Another big issue is scalability. 
So it's not the end of the world if you're starting out and you have, you know, a few different modals, but as you grow and get bigger and bigger, then that becomes a much larger issue. And then let's say I want to make one little change. I have to go in into every single one of those modals that lives on any page and make that change. And that is nearly impossible to do and will take an extensive amount of time. So now I'm going to talk about building the design system at Openly. So I know that, um, you know, a lot of times I've listened to a lot of design system talks and they kind of talk about, you know, how to build a design system very generally um, and focus on more of the principles of a design system and all of that. Today, instead, I'm going to focus more on the experience I went through as a sole designer building a design system, especially at a startup. Uh, I feel like this is something that's, you know, not talked about enough. I'm going to definitely talk about the challenges and all of those things like that. And feel free, you know, at the end to ask any questions you have. So when I joined my current company, I was the first person hired on product aside from the VP. So there was no design system in place, nothing like that at all. When I joined, what there was was an existing product that was created by the engineering team that was, you know, a rush to get out to have something out in market. But we soon realized that that wasn't scalable because there was no design system. There was no way for us to continually build and iterate on it without having to spend a large chunk of time. So when I started, our team was product designer, which is myself, two front end engineers and the VP of product. So at this point, I was given the login to Figma and kind of said, okay, well, let's start this new project. We're going to revamp the entire product. So with that in mind, we knew we had, you know, a business need, a business goal, which was to redo the whole product. But then also on the other hand, we knew that we wanted to focus on the design system. So our three options were focus only on the design system, which would mean I spend all of my time in the design system. The engineers spend all their time in the design system and we don't work on building a product. Option two was to fill out a product in the design system at the same time. So as we built the product, we would be constantly iterating on and creating a design system. And third choice was outsource the design system and focus on the product. So we started by outsourcing the design system. So what we did was I created a super light mock of what the page could potentially look like and sent that off to a freelancer and said, take this and build a whole design system. Now, you know, in, in theory, this can work, but in practice, it didn't. One, the person wasn't close enough to our product to know exactly what we needed. And two, all of a sudden, all these different atoms and components were created. We don't even know if we need them yet. And they were created based on a super early mock. So the problem was we over-engineered our design system and only considered use case for each component. And you built the design system without having the final mock. And the problem grew. So engineering started to build the over-design components that were not versatile and too descriptive for a current state. So if I look back at the beginning, this is in April of 2011. You can see here, we have all these different pages of all these different components. And at this point, we don't even have anything released. So, you know, this is where we started to see a problem having all these super, super specific components. And, you know, we don't even know where they're gonna be used and all of that. So then this problem grew more and more because we decided to, okay, let's just continue over engineer. Let's think of all the possibilities of everything we could possibly do. So for example, if you look at a card here, these are a bunch of different variations for a card that we thought, okay, if we think of every possibility now, then we can engineer a card that will think of all these possibilities and allow us to scale, which is not the case. So what ended up happening is we over-engineered even more. So I went ahead and created every different variation of a label and value so that I could put this in a specific card and created stuff for tables, even though we had no sense of what a table would be, but tried to componentize it as much as possible so that when we did get to it, okay, these are gonna consider all the variations. But as you can see here, building out the components too early didn't really work. So you can see we have all these different components built out. And again, we still don't even have a product release or a final mock. 
So building out all of these, you know, different atoms, different, you know, large molecules and components was not beneficial. So then we decided to pause and realize, okay, we can't keep going down this path. We're getting ourselves into a place where, you know, we are pigeonholing what we can do. I, you know, was trying to design a card and I felt like I was designing a card based on what engineering had in place. And it was only, you know, the first few months of starting. So we realized, okay, that, you know, can't be right. There has to be a better way. So we, you know, did a lot of research and decided on atomic design, you know, came across this and realized, okay, this is going to be something that's going to be super helpful for us. So atomic design is essentially taking things from the smallest possible state, which would be atoms. Oopsie. So atoms would be things like a radio or a checkbox, things that can't be broken down any more than they currently are. So essentially in December of 2021, we restarted. So if you look back at what I previously had, which was a long list of components, we basically scratched most of them and brought it back down to the most basic steps which I, like I said, are atoms. So we had a radio, checkbox, input box, pills, buttons, and breadcrumbs. This is breaking down all the way to square one. So then we would take atoms and combine them to create molecules. So in here, you can see you have a user text, which is, this is an input, the input label, and then maybe an icon. And here we put that together and this creates a molecule. So this is actually a date picker that can be used. So then if you take molecules and combine it with other molecules, you'll create organisms. This is kind of the flow of atomic design. I highly suggest if you haven't had a chance to look into it, definitely look into it. I'm not gonna focus too much on the details of it today, but just kind of want to give you an overview of what it is and how it worked for us. So how did this help us? Well, it helped us a lot with building a card. So like I explained earlier, we tried to create all these variations of a card and try to be super, super descriptive with it instead of just saying, okay, you know what? Let's take a step back, go super basic and super broad and realize that what a card really is, is a box that can have a slot for a card header, a card body, and maybe a card footer. So that's what we did here. We had a slot for the card header which within that we would have a molecule and inside that we'd have an atom, which would be an icon. And then even further in there, we'd have another slot, which would have more atoms. So slots were just containers that were housing different parts. Then we'd have another slot that would contain a card body. And in here you can see there's labeled data, there's pill, but anything could go in here. We really broke it down to the most basic aspects so that we could in the future create a scalable design system. So like you saw, like I just talked about, this is what the card actually looks like. So right here we have the body and here we have, you know, like I said, labeled data, a pill, more labeled data in the header. We have an icon here, an icon here and some text. And the only thing that we decided which was going to be written into the card was the padding around it. So that was the only thing that was not gonna change. Whatever was in it was always able to be changed. So you heard me just talk a lot about slots in Figma. So what are slots? So slots are essentially containers that content can go in. So we decided to go with slots because as a single designer, building the design system while we were actually going ahead and building the product, we knew we had to be super, super versatile and basic and knew that, you know, because we had no, nothing to go off of other than the current screen we're working on, we didn't want to get ourselves into a pigeonhole. So slots was a great way to help us. So what that meant is I can create a card and put whatever content I want in there. I don't have to decide now if cards are going to have images, if cards are going to include tables, if cards are going to include pills. I didn't have to decide any of that. All I had to decide was that a card can consist of a body, a header, and what that padding was for each of those. And when it got to a point where I knew, you know, each header is gonna have a title, okay, at that point, then that part would become an atom. So as you can see here, this card title is now an atom. 
because we know every single card that has a header in the header, there's going to be this title. So we did not even release our first product until January of 2022. The reason for that was because we tried to do the design system and the product at the same time and had to do a bunch of iterations along the way. So it was a lot of two steps forward, one step back. Um, and then we got to creating this activity feed. So this is our first actual release. So an activity feed is basically just a list of a bunch of different um, activities that have happened in the course of what I work on, which is uh, insurance, a course of a policy. So releasing this first activity feed, you know, we had to create all these different atoms that went into it and then molecules and then created a template and a page. Now, from here, what we were able to do is actually test the design system at the same time as releasing this feature. So how are we able to do that? Well, by releasing this feature and having you know, analytics actually test the different parts, we're able to see what works and what doesn't and do the components and smaller pieces hold up on the page. Is there confusion on the purpose of certain components? And we did find by testing the activity feed that there was. The main thing was that these pills over here, people thought were clickable. And so, you know, instead of being a function, which was just to kind of explain what was going on, people were trying to click on it. So what we were able to do for that is, okay, let's go back all the way down to the atom and think how we can rethink this atom. So what we did for that is we decided, all right, let's make these more pill-like and make them less like the button because right now they look a lot like the button and them causing confusion. So we iterated on that. Another thing we found is that the information in the top right got really lost. So we were able to take that information and just put it in the body of the card. We were able to do that because we had made the card at such a basic level. If it wasn't made at such a basic level, we wouldn't have had this ability. So like I said, we were able to change the card layout and change the pill anatomy. So we did that through a slots plugin. So this is something that for me worked really, really well throughout the entire um, process, but slots don't work for everyone. So the reason slots really helped me was because um, slots helped me kind of put content in a specific place. So slots are really well known in the engineering world and that's how they compartmentalize different products, but it's not really a thing that is known as much in the design world and definitely not in Figma. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can I replicate what is done in engineering in here. And I did it through this plugin. This plugin has helped me a lot. So I thought I would share it. Fortunately, the video of how it works is not there, um, but that's all right. So now I'm just gonna focus a little bit on kind of taking a step back, thinking about all the challenges I faced. So the first challenge I faced was like we went over over engineering from both my side and the design system. So meaning my design side. So because we decided to make all these super specific components early on, like I said, we pigeonholed ourselves and over designed. Then that left me at a place of feeling overwhelmed and not knowing what to do and unsure of if at this time I should either A, you know, just keep pushing forward or B, speak up, no, I'm going to stop and create some friction and pause our process, but in the long run, it would be better. So I chose that path and I highly suggest it. It definitely took me some time to, you know, get my voice and feel like I was able to share this information and talk to the rest of the team, but it ended up working out really well for us. Another thing is anytime I feel like I'm starting to over-engineer a component, I try to take a step back, realizing that the design system is always going to be a super iterative process and I'm never going to, you know, be at a final state. So even now with the cards, all these months later, I still am using the same card that I previously was. I have not made it any more prescriptive or anything like that because I don't want to pigeonhole myself or over-design. Sorry.
So like I said, the main things to remember are do not over design when starting. Start small. Atomic design can be your best friend and making sure your design system is super, super flexible. That's the main key, I would say, and starting really small. So I know that was kind of a lot in a short time period, um, and I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. So would love to open up the floor. Awesome. That was great, Risa. Thanks for taking us through that. Um, guys, this is the time to ask your questions. So please raise your hand and you can ask one by one. Here we have someone. Uh, James, do you want to ask? Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, great. Nice presentation. Hi, it's uh, very thorough. You question. You can unmute and ask. Oh, yeah. Um, so my question was, uh, since you're using nested components, which may have variants, how do you work around um, consumers of uh, your design system uh, using the main component and then having access to the variants? Do you give instruction for them to discover the nested components or um, do you have like another way of doing it? Yeah, so when you say um, nested components, um, are you referring to these smaller ones? Yeah, so like in, I think one of your specific examples with the form, um, the form had like a text field and then some other things in there. Um, this one? Yeah, this one. So maybe like your nested input, the text field, for example, uh, within this form element. When you have cases like this, um, how how does your team uh, understand how many levels are nested in a particular like main component and um, what is your communication look like or I guess documentation yeah. around it? Yeah, so I actually break it up into the atoms. So we have the atoms kind of written out in documentation, which is this input box, this question mark and this, and then I will go through and show all the variations. So this is when it's in its most basic state. There's another state where it can be, um, which would be when it is in, you know, a error state, another state when there is text in it and all of those are written out, but they know at the most basic level, these are the atoms, which are actually going to be components that are in the design system. And those are gonna match the components that are in the design system for the engineering team. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So maybe for like a more complex component where you're building with atoms uh, or some molecules into a template, um, how do you, what, what does it look like with the consumers of the design system who are designers um, using that component for the first time and maybe not understanding what can be changed because of the variance in the nested components? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So actually what I use to help that is um, slots, like I said. So the I'd say that there's two sides to the slot. One is there's less nested components. So it's easier for a different designer to go in and make you know changes, like I said, to adding certain things. On the other side of that, it can create a little bit more variation. So let me go ahead and um, share actually a different page quickly um, that hopefully will show you how that works. So if I go into here, this is what I consider a panel molecule. So this is a more complex, um, you know, uh, component. So in here, we just have this, you know, box, which is the card and up in here, and they can go in and adjust and put anything that, you know, can go in here in here. I go ahead and I, you know, create an anatomy as well as examples of what it would look like in real life. But because we're at such an early stage, and I'm not going to be super subscriptive of this can be in there and this cannot. It's more of as we go along, okay, let's discuss and let's figure out. So for example, it became clear that these certain um, 
this pattern was going to be a pattern that's going to be used over and over. So that itself became an atom that we can put within here. But, you know, I'm not deciding what exactly can go in the car. Okay. Yeah, this, this makes sense um, for the uh, components that can have quite a, a lot of variance um, in the... Oh, this will be the last question. Just so no, yeah, some other people a chance. Um, so in the case where you have a component that is, it, it is reused quite often. The um, baseline is set. However, maybe you built it with a another component that has, let's say, five variants. Um, in that case, because you already have your atom in place do you encourage people to go in the nested component and then like make a new variant because it's possible or do you include gotcha. some kind of like guidance to do or not do that? Yeah, so let's take an example of a dialog box, right? So in here, I can go ahead and I can go and change this, you know, button to be whatever I want. So in this case, no, I would say, you know, because this stuff is already all um, set, it would be, you know, if they want to make a change at that point, it'd be like, okay, let's discuss it. Let's bring it with engineering and see what problem they're trying to solve. And if we already have a component that solves that. So, you know, let's say they're using this error message and they realize that, okay, they don't want it to say delete. Well, they might think, let me just try to redo this and keep this error message, but instead what they might do is, okay, maybe it's no longer an error message based on, you know, what we consider an error message, maybe it's a warning message. And so then we wouldn't need to actually change the variant of, you know, this atom to the primary um, button. Instead, we would just change the dialogue variant that is being used. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. That, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Of course. You. Um, ITBT, do you want to unmute and ask? Hi. Um, Hello. Hi, Risa. Thank you so much. You were just amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, for like some past six months, I was hired by like a SaaS company. It's a SaaS and PaaS product. And they are like bringing new features which the competitors do not have yet. Like it's a super customized product for a very niche audience, you know? Mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, uh, for something like someone has deployed their server and after that, for their email, they just want to generate a customized forwarding email. You know, everything is super customized. You don't find such things, find such references on Dribble, even, you know, from the competitors. And we had been doing this product before me, like there were uh, two front-end developers, three back-end developers, and they were just doing it all by themselves. And, you know, it was not looking very good. And they just got some, they just got me on board and I took up that product and I designed the new existing features. But as we go along and now we are realizing like things are getting inconsistent and yeah, uh, the new features which I designed, they look different from the existing. And now we want to have to remap the whole product and that's gonna take a lot of time and we need a design system. So. What should I do? Shall I just build the design system first? Or shall I build the design system along with the product? Or shall I build the product first and then take the yeah. components and do the design system? Like it's yeah. a huge product. I have done like 200 pages and still 200 more to go. So what should I do? Yeah, so actually, you know, on a smaller scale, I ran into a similar problem. So when I joined, yeah. there was an existing product that had no design system or anything in place. And then I started designing new screens that looked completely different. Exactly. So what I did is essentially, you know, 
decide that, okay, we're going to eventually rebuild what is already there. So I'm trying to find this page. We're going to rebuild what is already there. But in the meantime, I can do an audit of the, of, you know, the pages that I have. So if I already had built out a few pages before I actually got to a design system, I'd probably do an audit of my new design. So looking at here, what I would do if I'm doing an audit is I would say, all right, I'm going to take new transaction, new quote, those are buttons that's going to be added in my design system. I can see we have pills here, two different variations that'll be added in my design system. I'm seeing that we have the tab structure. And if there's different tab structures, you know, figuring out which one to use or at least putting them side by side and, you know, creating a middle ground or, you know, we create rules where one tab structure is used here, another tab structure is used there. But I definitely suggest doing an audit of what you currently have. And not trying to, you know, also have it match everything that was previously done. Because that's going to be hard to do. Um, so that's kind of how I went about it. And that would be my suggestion. Mm, all right. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely that does. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Um, hey, Omkar, you can unmute and ask. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, hi, Riza. Hi, David. Hello. Sorry if I have pronounced wrong. Oh, uh, so, Riza, I, I have a question. I have two questions right now. The first one is a very basic question. Uh, like, um, while creating a design system as a only person, so how to uh, get started uh, with components uh, means how to decide how much uh, size it will require uh, for our dashboard even we have not finalized a dashboard size or desktop size okay then one more thing was uh, when you are creating components for mobile system so how much uh, size it will uh, need so how to figure out these things uh, i'm still struggling i'm not getting exact uh, solution for this thing yeah so i think there's a few ways to go about it so first no matter what you're probably going to start with things that are even smaller than atoms so that would be things like typography and color Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, those are already decided for you based on the website or other stuff like that. But figuring mm -hmm. those out is kind of the most basic thing. Then from there, you know, when you're talking about sizing and stuff, a lot of times if the developers are using a certain framework, so for example, at my company, they're using Tailwind. So I could have spent, you know, so much time looking at what stack size is used for everything and all of that. And I actually did do that and it ended up eating up a lot of time. But the easier route would be asking the developers, hey, is there already a framework with, you know, the program you're using um, that already dictates the different sizes? So for me, uh, using, they use Tailwind and it already says, this is the size that's for mobile. This is the size that's for desktop. And then from there, kind of, okay, I now at least have my screen sizes and then going from there. And then in terms of grids and stuff like that, you know, that kind of takes some time, but I always like to use the rule of 16. So I make sure everything goes into 16. And then I start adding grids when I feel like, okay, I have maybe more than one card on the page. How are they going to fit together? And I start with desktop and go to mobile, but it really depends. The only reason I do that is because my product is much more um, a desktop product versus a mobile product, but I definitely try to consider it all. And in terms of like sizing of things like buttons and stuff like that, I'd say go with, you know, kind of best practices. So a lot of the time the height of buttons are 40. That's a really good um, best practice or text sizes. A lot of times body text starts at 16 and the lowest it can go to is 12 and then starting from there. So finding like super basic things online about those super basic parts. Uh, and then from there building kind of around it and knowing that, you know, I might change. So for example, with my buttons, I think I started at a height of, you know, 45. And then when I got to creating inputs, I realized that's way too tall for inputs. And I want to make sure buttons and inputs are going to be the same height. So I bring buttons down to 40 so that that works. Or, you know, with pills, I didn't want the pills to be, you know, way smaller than text. So let me make sure that those are aligned. So it's kind of, you know, setting a little bit of framework in front and then iterating and then, you know, 
reworking that framework. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, looks good. Perfect. The second was, uh, second question is uh, about accessibility. Uh, so if you, uh, the company where I am currently working, uh, having a LMS product. So we are having a few clients. Uh, those are asking for accessibility things because they are having uh, people who has a accessibility issue and of color blindness uh, kind of thing. Those comes under the accessibility. So how to uh, deal with uh, these things means how to get started uh, with accessibility part and what are the things we should keep in mind while doing working yeah. on these things. So I think the first thing that I did was thinking about color. So, you know, whether you're using Figma or whatever you're using, a lot of them have plugins that will show you accessibility. So mm -hmm. it's both, you know, text size on certain backgrounds and then color on certain backgrounds and making sure those are accessible. Then the second thing I did was making sure I have a focus state for almost everything. So if I'm thinking through and I want to tab through on my desktop, what would that focus state be like? So for example, you know, I would, I've tested it by going into Google or LinkedIn and just tabbing around and seeing, okay, well, what is, you know, what, when I'm tabbing around, what can I tab to? So even here, I would say, okay, making sure that I can use the tab keys to go from activity to overview and making sure that I have a focus state on each box and each input that, you know, you might not be using if I am someone who's just clicking on it. But if I'm tabbing through for accessibility purposes, you want to make sure to have that focus state and then working a lot with the engineers. So a lot of the accessibility will actually come in from the engineers doing the code to make sure you can do all those different um, tabbing features. So even if you have, you know, I want the focus state kind of talking to about them to about why you need it. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, engineers have done some sort of accessibility before or kind of know where to get started. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so of much. Of course. Um, hey, Jerusha. Um, I think you can unmute and ask. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, so yeah. my system, my questions actually um, a little bit uh, a deviation from design system, but uh, since uh, a design system needs to be constantly updated and flexible. I wanted to know how you manage to do that and keep it, you know, updated. So if suppose you're using Figma and everything needs to be sorted and organized, how do you manage to do that? And do you think atomic design system helps in that as well? Yeah, so I definitely think atomic design helps. So I kind of use atomic design to break it down. So I organized it by, okay, these are the atoms and I know I'm going to need them. You know, I don't know when, but I know I'm gonna need them. So we have my atoms. And then as I am building my products, I'm constantly iterating on, you know, the different molecules. So let's say, you know, I now use a panel or I use a modal in a new way. I'm gonna go ahead and add some sort of documentation around that to Figma so that it's constantly evolving or, you know, when it comes to doing tables, I'm starting out with the table super basic, but then I know I'm adding filters and I know I'm adding sorting. So adding those in, and then every time I have a new example of that, putting that in the design system. So not only are the most basic components gonna be in there, but they're actual examples that are using those basic components. That's then gonna allow me to you know, create a design system that can scale very easily, um, create a lot of speed so that if I you know, go into, like I said, the table, I can pull a table that actually has real content in it into my design. Um, and there'll be a bunch of different variations of that already in my design system. So I think it's constantly iterating and I like to do it, you know, when I'm doing the feature versus afterward, because I tend to forget. So if I'm releasing a feature and I knew a new part is going in, I'll at the very least pull that, you know, piece in the mock and put it in the design system. Okay, thank you. Of course, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Martins, you can probably ask yours. Hello, uh, Riza, I want to ask one thing. How you document uh, the design system? You document it in Figma file, you use another tool to, to do that. How you document the, the patterns that you use in the 
design system. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, how you to document the, the parts of the design system? Use the Figma file or use a, a third party tool? Yes, yeah, so because I'm still um, really early on and you know I'm the only designer and still at a small company, I use Figma to document mine all. So I tried to look at you know other examples of how people do it in Figma. I know for the most part, a lot of people don't do it in Figma. So I kind of had to come up with this myself, but what I found for myself and for other engineers, which was important for them when looking at it is having, okay, this is a component, some examples of the component, the anatomy of the component, which is includes padding and all that stuff. If I feel like it needs to have information about behavior or not. And again, this all can be added to, you know, based on situations that arise. Um, and then a full example of how it will look on the screen. And so I try to, once I feel like a component is in a good place and I'm actually using it in my, you know, products, I will make sure I have all this information in place to the best of my ability. And, you know, for example, um, not all of them are going to have do's and don'ts, um, but, you know, it just will depend on the component and again, depend on questions that are asked. So we get to a point where it feels like there's confusion around a certain component. I will try my best to add that, you know, documentation into the design system as well, because I know that question is probably going to come up again. Okay, uh, another question. Do you use some uh, branching type of that Figma can provide to provide certain versions to the development team and you are working in another advanced uh, file? Yes, so what I do is I only have things that are going to be in this main branch of the design system once they're actually live and built in um, to what our development team uses, which is Storybook. But I'll create a branch for every time I'm going to be adding, you know, updating stuff to a specific component. So let's say I'm going to be um, adding, you know, a new way of button. So that's something I did recently. So before we didn't dictate that all buttons need to be title case. So I went in, in the design system, I made a branch that just said title case for buttons. And once that is released from the engineering standpoint and it's being used live in our products, then I will also go ahead and release it in here so that I'm not affecting all other components and all other places that it's being used. And I also know, okay, it's still not live. That allows me to keep track of, do I need to remind them? Are we still doing this? Where does this go on the time on the, um, timeline. Okay, thanks. That's all. Thanks. Um, I think we have Ajit as well. Hello. Hey, guys. Thank you. Um, so thanks, Liza, first of all, for sharing the real world experience. Uh, it's really great to hear and very rare to hear like uh, real projects on design systems. So thanks a lot. Uh, so my question is about uh, the brand identity or the visual language. Um, so, uh, just wanted to check, like, at, at any point, did it happen, like, where uh, maybe you put a significant effort on, like, doing the design system as well as doing a couple of sections in the application, like, say, you spend three, four weeks where you are, like, you know, halfway uh, done with uh, making some components and, say, like, 30, 40 screens have been designed. And at that point, did you or your product manager or someone uh, in the team felt that, you know, this is not... Uh, we, because when we make the components, we kind of we might miss out on the whole uh, look and feel of the site, and like those things that might happen. And did it at any point happen that you know you yourself were, were like you know I I don't know how is this panning out, and should I like you know revamp the whole thing that I did in the last couple of weeks in terms of brand identity and uh, visual language? So, yeah, definitely. So um, you know, I think that especially when I'm getting into building a component and I don't actually put it on the screen, I can run into that a lot. So one thing I ran into was when doing that, you know, as you can see here, and it's just been iterated since is there's so much purple going on and it feels like it's almost overpowering. And especially with, you know, the header up here, as you can see, um, it, you know, really what is drawing your eye. And so I realized, you know, after being out there for a little bit, okay, actually we're going to need to redo this and take a step back. And so you know, I was able to whip that up. And then in terms of when the developers were going to do that, I kind of put that on the product manager to say, hey, I know this isn't going to create a massive business impact, but I still think this is really important. 
So where is this going to fall on, you know, the roadmap of things we need to work on? So I definitely think that's super common, especially when, you know, I'm designing, I'm still designing the design system. There's going to be times when I, you know, build out all these different components, put it on a page, and it's not going to look great together, which is why, you know, I always find it's best to actually test at the page level, because it's hard to test when you're just looking at one atom, or you're even looking at a molecule. When you see it all together, that's when you decide, okay, this works or this doesn't work. You know, I also found that with tables. I was trying to at first put tables in a card and I found that doing it that way kind of made the table um, seem crowded. And so I didn't even realize that until I put it on a full page. So little mm-hmm. things like that, I think it's always important to do and always important to bring up. And so whether or not it's done today or down the line, I'm still going to try to design, you know, some degree, but I also don't want to over-design. So, you know, I could go and I could nitpick all of my designs forever. I think most designers can. And, you know, I have to keep in mind that I need to keep, be focused on the North Star, which is the business need. So at a certain point, I need to say, okay, this is good enough. It does work. It does fit. You know, there's not any glaring issues. And so I'm going to take a step back from it. And if I have free time down the line and I want to take a second look at it, I can, but knowing that it might actually not get released, because it's not going to be as high as a priority. Thanks, and thanks a lot. Glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question as well, but I haven't really framed it properly in my head. So please bear with me. So um, I'm working on this fintech app, which is actually in two languages, English and Spanish. So we are revamping revamping the whole application where the target audience is mostly the older uh, audience, say 50 plus. So, uh, and who are not very good with English or technology. So uh, we are going flow by flow to reiterate and rebrand and all of that. So once I have established a design for a form, say a form, and I've used it for this bank transfer flow and I've passed it on to the developers and we have released it as our first test as well and to the audience as well. So when I move further ahead in other flows, we realize that the form template has to be changed a little bit to fit in other features. And that looks slightly different from the old forms. So now I cannot go back to the older screens and change the form because it's already been released and we have to focus on the upcoming flows. So in that case, it's very hard to have a design system in place. So what do we do? Yeah. Yeah. So what I would say is then is, you know, I think forms are a tricky one because you're not going to be able to anticipate all the different variations of forms. But I think you can create unison by at the most basic level, the inputs being the same. So, you know, I, for example, am experiencing a similar thing where we have forms for filling out, you know, personal information, then forms for, you know, with answering questions. So just making sure at the most basic level, I'm using the same things, but, you know, there's definitely going to be times when in the form, it's going to be a multiple choice question. And those questions are going to have, you know, a lot of information in them. And so it's going to look slightly different than a form that's just gonna have multiple choice and checkbox and that's it. And so the consistency is in the atoms. And so, you know, when I have consistent atoms, I think that's what helps best. So, you know, looking back at um, these, Hmm. you know, at this level, like I know every form is gonna have this, it's gonna have some sort of input label, the rest I can't dictate. Some might have, you know, what goes in here might be different. And that's okay, but at this level, they're gonna look the same so that if I put them together and I'm looking at the side to the side, you wouldn't say these are from two different systems. You might say, okay, these look a little different, but at the most basic level, they're the same. I think that's kind of what I would do going forward and knowing that like, you know, that's gonna happen no matter what, like it's really impossible to all the time from start to finish, make everything look the same because my design system is gonna continually be evolving. And if it didn't look different, it would, I, you know, you'd probably end up pigeonholing yourself into what, v1 was so you know for myself we have you know the first version like i said which had that really intense purple header bar and i knew you know i didn't like that but okay if you don't have time to change it now i'm going to you know at least um know that all those you know small parts of the header are use other places and then when i get time to being able to change it i will but for this for the time being i just make sure the most smallest atoms are uh, consistent 
Okay, okay. I get that. So you just add all the examples to the uh, design system to show variations of how it can look. In the yeah, future. exactly. You know, for example, like thinking about a, uh, when we did the dialogue box at my company. So we started by saying, okay, the dialogue needs to have two buttons and one has to say cancel. And we realized like that's not going to fit for every variation. And so instead of trying to rework the wording of the whole dialogue so that it always said cancel, we instead said, okay, you know, like we tried to make it work this way. We know we can't, you know, we can't go back and change all of them that say cancel because it needs to work that way. I'm just going to add this in as another example in my design system. And so every time, you know, I see like there's a new iteration, I'll just add it as an example and then try my best when I'm going to the next one, like, okay, does either cancel or um, go back those two, you know, type buttons fit into this next thing I'm doing? Or is there a real reason I need another variation? And if there is, then going together and talking with the um, engineers. But yeah, to go back to what I said, what I think goes best is every time I have a new variation or something like that, I'll actually put it in the design system as examples for me to go back to. And then if I get to a point where I'm looking at all these examples and they feel very, very different, then from there kind of taking a step back and understanding why do they look so different? Is there something that I can do going forward to make sure I don't uh, run into this again? Okay, that makes sense. Thanks a lot for that. Of course. Do we have any more questions? Okay, uh, we have something on the chat. Okay, I think that's a previous conversation follow-up. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to unmute and ask? Okay. Varun, please go ahead. Uh, am I audible? Yes. So, hi everyone. So, basically my question is, uh, like, when do we require like a design system? Like it is, of course it is helpful for, you know, extensive, uh, like intensive products. But when we are designing for, let's say uh, four to five screens or more website or something like that, this uh, UI part of it, not product. So do we also, like on that time, are we expected to like come with the design system? Yeah. So. For myself, I'm still the only designer here and I still find a design system really valuable. So the reason is because the main thing is speed. So even though I only have, you know, maybe four pages, there's still going to be reused components in each one. So, you know, from the most basic thing, there'll probably be buttons on multiple of them. There'll probably be some sort of header section. And so even though I have, you know, only four screens and from a consistency standpoint, I'll be able to keep consistency each time I'm building up those screens, having to start from scratch is going to take myself a lot more time as well as the engineering. So even if I only have a design system that has five or six things at this point, still when I'm creating that, you know, fifth screen, I'm able to pull those five or six, six things. And so it's engineering and that at least um, speeds up the process to some degree. So I think, you know, depending on how many people and how fast you're going, that will be the speed at which your design system grows. So you know, for me, we released one product at first and didn't have that many parts of the design system. And as we went on and on, now we have more parts, but it, you know, really depends on level of scale. But I always think having a design system is helpful. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Thank you. Cool. So if we do not have any more questions, I think we can wrap up this session. So last call for any more questions. Okay, I think we can wrap up the session in that case. Um, cool, so thanks a lot everybody for attending this session. And I personally love design systems and I loved hearing about your journey and your company as well. So thanks for that. Um, all of you can connect with Risa on LinkedIn and ADP list as well. And- awesome. Looks like we have one question. Sorry? Looks oh, like okay. someone has a question. Sorry, I didn't see that. Do you want to take that? Sure. Okay. Alex, please ask your question. Hello, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was... 
Uh, hey, Risa. Hi. Uh, thank you hi. so much for this uh, session. Uh, my question is just very simple. Uh, so at the early stage of any product, um, <clears throat> uh, is it must to have a design system or uh, can we adapt with the existing uh, design system in the market? Like, like for example, uh, Google material design. So yeah, how does that go? Yeah, so it really depends um, on what you want. So, you know, there are a lot of open source design systems, so you can adapt one of those um, and go from there. I, um, you know, that'll be super established. So I'd probably start by adapting only small parts of it if I'm going to do it that way. Um, especially if, you know, you don't feel like you have the time, it's definitely a good way to go about it. And then kind of, you know, as you go on, you know, by adopting it, you'll probably end up making some tweaks to it and making it kind of your own. So I don't think there's any negative with doing it. I think, you know, if you're definitely starting from scratch and you want a design system to even get started on the product, starting from there works. I definitely have done it with certain um, parts of it. So like, for example, you know, buttons I pulled in from an existing framework from someone else, um, you know, there already are these existing frameworks because they work. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel every time. You know, for example, a table, I wasn't going to build out a tape myself. Instead, I took a table component from an open source and kind of iterated on that to meet my needs. Um, but I didn't start from ground zero. Okay. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Uh, um, okay. Nobody else, right? Hello. Hi, Dilip. Yeah, uh, I have one question actually. Uh, on on before we start building onto the design system, how do we know the exact dimensions of any component? Like, are we going with a standard one? Is there a standard uh, protocol or a design system? Like, uh, yeah. creating on the components text boxes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, that's a good question. It depends. So if I'm, for example, for desktop, I decided to start with a um, 1440 width for mobile, it's normally going to be 320. And then within that, I'm going to create, you know, a card that is going to fit into a 16 um, point system. So, you know, I'll know, for example, for mobile, the card is not going to be the full width, I'm going to need at least padding on either side. So that's already going to take it down to a certain size. And then I want to make sure that padding is consistent. It goes into that, you know, 16 point scale. So that will kind of help you um, having that 16 point scale or, you know, you can use eight, it's really up to you, but making sure that every, you know, box and everything you create and every gap you have kind of fits into that works really well. So uh, that's kind of how I have done it. And I find, you know, that's pretty standard across everything, especially when getting started. Um, you know, it's definitely harder on starting on desktop. So if you have the opportunity to start on mobile, it's easier to do because you don't have as much room to, you know, play with. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the question. Thank you. Of course. Cool. Um, so, Sunny, if you, uh, if someone wants to share the LinkedIn profile, you can share on chat or you can just uh, type out Risa's full name. I think you'll be able to locate very easily on LinkedIn. Yes, I can share that quickly. Okay. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, awesome. Okay, I think we can wrap up the session now. So you guys know the drill. Um, if you have any solid topics for the upcoming sessions, do let me know or Rutkash or anybody from Design Boat. And uh, one thing that's different is we usually have demo classes on Sundays. Uh, so Design Boat is a UI UX school, which has uh, demo classes to give a glimpse of the bootcamp. So we have tweaked that up a little bit where uh, most of the session is going to be open for asking questions. So Harsha will be there to answer all your questions. And um, if you want to register, you just have to go to the Design Boat website and you'll be able to register for the session. So thanks a lot, Risa, again for this session. I absolutely Bye. loved it. I'm 
sure all of us took notes as well. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.